Are you new to teaching elementary music or do you feel like you're just spinning your wheels every day in your classroom? Maybe you're overwhelmed and honestly just don't know where to go for advice and mentorship. Hi, I'm Jessica, and when I'm not drinking all the coffee, watching Razorback sports, or hanging out with my family of boys, it's my passion to help elementary music teachers just like you teach your students by using your unique personality and teaching style. In this podcast, you'll find helpful tips, strategies, and ideas that will help you kick that stress to the curb and begin teaching music with confidence. Let's get started. Well, hey there. Welcome back to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. I am your host, Jessica Peresta, and you are listening to episode 111, and this is a Facebook Live taken directly from the free Start the School Year Off Right Challenge I did back in early July. So this episode, we are going to talk all about classroom management, setting up your classroom, and mindset as a music teacher even if you are teaching virtually on a cart or insert any other situation, fill in the blank. This challenge, this particular Facebook Live came from challenge day one, and it was a five-day challenge I did. It is not posted in the Facebook group anymore, but you can still join the free Facebook community. Just look up the elementary music teacher community, or you can find it in the show notes. And be on the lookout in this podcast, because I'll be announcing the dates for a winter challenge I'll be doing as well as next summer's challenge, the closer to next summer. So I really hope you can join us for the next challenge. And this will just give you a little taste of what um, one of the days of the challenge looked like. And as the challenge goes on, we do a Facebook live every day, as well as daily emails and daily question prompts in the Facebook group. But not only that, it actually is a 30 day challenge. It's continuing um, on. It just finished with my Harmony members for 30 days. So this episode is a little bit longer than normal, but just listen to it on your drive to wherever you're going. Um, and you can break it up into multiple days if you need to, but I really hope you find value from this episode. So I'm so excited for you to listen. So let's get started. But today um, is all about how to start the school year off with success. Obviously, I wanted to do this on day one because that is a huge topic. And I I could have done a million things under this umbrella of this topic, right? But I chose to talk about classroom management, setting up your classroom, and your mindset. Because if we can talk about mindset above everything else, getting you focused on, yes, things may not be what I want them to be right now. Things may be totally different. This is a huge shift for me. Um, I miss being in my classroom. I miss seeing my students in person. All that is completely normal, and you're allowed to have feelings. I tell teachers all the time, if you've ever heard me on my podcast or in, you know, on video or whatever, you're not a robot, okay? So you are going to have feelings. You're allowed to have feelings and emotions. It's completely normal. If you don't have feelings, then that's okay. Everybody's a little bit more emotional than each other, okay? But you're allowed to have feelings about the way last school year ended and about maybe not knowing or knowing the way this coming school year is going to go. You're allowed to feel frustrated and overwhelmed. I want you to know that have feelings, let yourself process through emotions. And we're going to talk about mindset today. So first thing I want to do is talk about classroom management strategies. All right. So when I created this challenge last summer, and some of you may be going through it for the second time, I did not need to talk about classroom management strategies for virtual teaching, or what would it look like if you're teaching on a cart? Or what would it look like if you're simulcast teaching from your classroom? Or are you sending home paper packets or, 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 or it was simply here's classroom management strategies. You could maybe apply or tweak or revisit or reframe to meet your students where they're at. Right. But I am very aware. And in fact, I had all my emails ready to go and then COVID-19 happened and I went, Skr, you know, like that record, you know, I don't even know. Is this how you do it? You scratch it. And I <laughs> had to rewind the tape and go back and revisit some of these emails and what I was going to say in these Facebook lives, because I want this more than anything to be super relevant for you, because I want you to have some strategies and ideas to bring back to your teaching situation, no matter what it looks like in the fall. I know, and you can tell me in the comments too, that some of you already know what you're facing in the fall. I also know there are some of you that are in fear of maybe not having a job, which breaks my heart. I have heard it so many times. Um, I also know some of you, (laughs) 
some just aren't sure yet. You might, you have told you might be doing this. You may be doing this. They're not sure yet. It's just a big guessing game. And then I do know there are some of you in here that have already been told you're doing it this way. So whatever way you find yourself in, I want to go through different classroom management strategies so you can have some simple ideas to apply to whatever your teaching situation does end up looking like. And maybe you don't know what it is yet. So take some of these strategies and um, jot it down so you can get some ideas. Okay. With that said, let's, like I said, let's talk about classroom management first. The first thing with classroom management that's always really helpful to remember, one of the very first things I always tell teachers is every class you have is different. Some of you may be um, K through 12 teachers. Some of you might teach K through six. Some may teach pre-K through five, pre-K through four, um, pre-K through second, just fourth and fifth. Your, your situation looks different than anyone. Not only that, you each teach a different demographics of kiddos. You teach, um, some might be private school, charter school, public school, name any other school. Um, it, it's all different. But no matter what grade levels you teach or where, what, your school building looks like, some of you may not be in a building, we'll get into that in a minute. You, every class you see, you're gonna have a different classroom management approach. I am not sitting here telling you to come up with a different classroom management um, system for every single class, that's insane. You can't do stickers with one, the other one you're gonna do points, the other one you're gonna do cards, the other one's gonna have class rewards, they're not gonna have class rewards, no, 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 no. What I'm meaning is you are have set a classroom management strategy and then you're going to just need to change it up here or there, subtle tweaks to meet each class. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have two fourth grade and we're talking about teaching in person right now. OK, we are going to talk about all the other teaching situations in just a minute. Let's say you have two different fourth grade classes and um, I'm speaking from experience here. One of them, I don't know who made this schedule. But let's, well, let's be honest, people in the office and let's, or the teachers did, you know, but let's say that they, this one class comes into you and for some reason it's like 90, we can't say hundred percent, but like 90% of this class is just like a delight to have in music. They're listening, paying attention. It's like anything you do, you could literally say, let's sing Twinkle Little Star and they would be so about it. Just such a delight to have. It's like everything you try works. You don't really even have to like have a lot of classroom management strategies in place because it seems to just flow naturally. Then you get this other fourth grade class and you're like, wait a second, who decided to make this schedule? Why is this one so much easier than this class? And you're noticing right away, you got to put a little bit more effort into classroom management with this class because of the dynamic of the class. No, it's just the way it is. It may be actually, I just, has anybody seen, I don't know why this just came to mind. I have three little boys, um, for kiosk a question on Disney plus, And it just made me think that's just the way the cookie crumbles. He says it over and over anyway, sorry. Um, but yes, it's so true. It's like you, in a lot of time, a lot of those things, and I've been answering some of your questions in the Facebook group, a lot of those things you're not going to really know about until you get to know your students, until you meet your kiddos, you kind of learn the dynamics of the classes, what makes them tick, how much can you spend on different activities and lessons, and do you need to like really, you know, have a you know big classroom management system in place, or can you be a little bit like, you don't really need to do as much. It just depends on the classes. It really does. Um, you also need to remember that your classroom management system does not necessarily need to look like everyone else's. When I first started out teaching, um, I've shared my story before, but I'm going to share it again because some of you may be new to me and that's okay. I started at a school that had not had music for seven years. It was in the inner city. I had no teaching resources, no instruments, no budget to buy anything. I actually had a broken hand drum and I did end up finding some old textbooks from the cabinets that used to be the drama closets buried under there like deep. Uh, I ended up just teaching music from those because that's all I had the first the first half of the school year. Um, I started in January. I quickly realized that what I had just learned in my student teaching experience from observing other teachers, from asking questions, I would try these classroom management approaches with my kids and it didn't necessarily work. Why? Because I was kind of trying to just copy what I saw someone else do. I was, it's not just about, um, I'm gonna just use stickers again. It's not just about, they did try to sticker system with their class and I tried it with my classes. It's not the sticker system that didn't work. It was that I did not put my approach in it. 
I did not get to know my students. I wasn't forming relationships. I was just making it about the rules, rules, rules. And there was no relationship forming, you know, going over procedures. But hey, here's what happens if you follow the procedures instead of just, um, you know, having conversations with individual kiddos, getting to know them. Why are you pushing back? What's going on in your life? Like having conversations, which I know as music teachers, it's so, so hard to do because you don't see your students very often. But you don't need to compare yourself to other teachers because it's okay um, to make things your own. Why? Because you're going to have a unique set of challenges, unique set of students. You're going to be at a unique school. You have a unique personality that sets you apart from any other teacher. You are you. And so let's say last school year, let's talk about pre-COVID, okay? <clears throat> let's say you tried something with your students and you felt like it just was not going good. It just was not working for whatever reason. And so maybe you decided you gave it enough time. And how do you know how much time to give something? It's up to you. It's up to you. How long do you try it before you know it's not working? I'm pretty sure you'll be able to tell. With classroom management, one thing I want you to really hear me about is you could have the best written out plan in the whole world. You could have a totally amazing system in place. But like I said, if you're not taking the time to form a relationship with your students and you're not taking the time to keep your class time moving, which is a huge part of it, not having a lot of downtime between activities like, OK, we just finished singing. Now let's spend two minutes between the singing and the instruments to go and move to the next spot but not giving them any direction about how to do that. How are they supposed to put their instruments up? What do you expect them to do with their bodies? Are they supposed to talk or not talk? Where do their hands go? Are they supposed to play their instruments on the way to put them back on the shelf or not? Every, um, the more procedures you can have in your classroom, the better. I know that sounds tedious and we're going to talk about ways to bring that online, but it's so true. The more procedures you have in place procedure for literally everything. And I started doing this. It made it feel like it was like tedious. Like, my gosh, I feel like I'm just giving these kids rules, but they learn to know what to expect. It ended up flowing better. And in return, I was able to teach more music because I wasn't sitting there feeling like I was constantly dealing with behavior issues and problems and the kids weren't listening. It took time. It, everything that's new takes time. And I've already told you guys some of that in the answers um, in the Facebook group. Sometimes, every, not sometimes, every time you try something new, whether it's classroom management, teaching virtually, meeting your students for the first time, being a first year teacher, it takes time. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Those of you in here who I know several of you who have even joined this group have been teaching some of you for 30 years. You know, I mean, I know it was a long time ago, but that your first year teaching, did you just walk in day one and immediately know what to do? I, I did not. <laughs> I did not. Um, that is not the way it went for me at all. In fact, I remember walking in, feeling over my head, um, knowing I needed to do classroom management, being like, I don't really know where to start. These kids haven't had music for seven years. In fact, they're in an art room next door with a long-term substitute teacher. I just shared that story on my podcast, but it was like overwhelming. Um, so I did not know what to do, but I remembered, I told myself, give yourself grace, stay patient with yourself. It's okay not to know everything on day one. Rome wasn't built in a day and it's so true. So just give yourself a time, give yourself grace, stay patient with yourself. We are our worst critics, aren't we? We are the hard, I'm speaking from experience. I'm talking about myself. I am so hard on myself when I don't get things right. I'm such a perfectionist. I'm such a type A personality that if I, like right now, when I tried to start this Facebook Live and it just kept going in circles and it wasn't starting, that is so frustrating. But you know what? Totally out of my control. I just moved on and kept going. And that's what you need to do in your classroom with your students. If you've tried classroom management and it's not working and you don't know why and you feel like you're just frustrated, keep researching, keep asking questions. Keep asking other teachers what they're doing. Take their approach maybe. And then, like I said, make it your own. Get to know your students. Form those relationships. And then um, see if there's a way you need to tweak it between the different grade levels or different classes in the same grade level as well. So I want you to think about this real quick. Procedures matter all year long. Procedures don't just matter at the beginning of the school year. And then it's like, well, we went over it. Hope you remember it the rest of the school year. I was guilty of that too, you guys. It's not, it, it just can't happen that way. It is like, 
I don't know, think about a car. You you buy a new car, you drive it off the lot, they put gas in it, and then you just don't put gas in it. The rest of the cars, it just won't drive, right? Maybe the worst analogy ever, but that's the first thing I could think of. Um, so with procedures, it goes right along with classroom management. You go over the procedures with your students. Remember, I said more procedures is better than just a few. And let me talk about the ones I mean. So you have your coming into the classroom procedures. I do have an agenda. It might be nice to use that, right? Let's see. Okay, I haven't even said anything on my agenda yet. You're not missing anything. Okay, <laughs> I told you I'm a talker. Okay, so you have your coming in to the classroom procedures. What procedures do you want? We've already talked about that. When the students get to their seats, do you have something you're doing when they come into the classroom? Are you maybe starting with a body percussion activity? Do you want them to have a vocal warm up? They're singing. Are they listening to music when they come in? Are you starting with a story? Does it just depend on what's happening in the classroom that day? Um, the students need to know what to expect for that. What happens with that when that warm up is done? What do they do next? Are you revisiting an activity from the previous time you saw them? Are you reviewing a song? Are you just jumping into a new song or activity right away? What do you do? What do the students need to do while you're teaching them? Do they echo sing after you? Are they needing to pat the steady beat on their lap while you sing? Then so while they're just listening, are you pointing at something on your smart board or your whiteboard? Are you holding something up for them to look at? What do they need to do while they're paying attention? What do what happens if they're not paying attention? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Every little thing, I started thinking about what goes on in my room. So you get through the lesson. When they go to the instruments, what happens? Are they taking the instruments back to their seats? What happens? Where do they put their chairs when they're done? If you're using chairs, because that goes, we're going to talk about setting up your classroom. That's unique to each teacher as well. What happens when they're leaving the room? Do you just say, everybody line up, let's go. Don't do that. It doesn't work. So, Or do you call them one at a time? Do you have them answer what I call popcorn questions as they line up at the door? Do you do exit tickets? Are you um, singing a song on the way out of class? Are you having them stand quietly and then handing out stickers for their class um, on their class sticker chart as they line up quietly because they did a great job? Are you, maybe you could even end class or begin class, I suggest doing one or the other by just having a normal conversation with something that's not even related to music. I love doing that. what you have for dinner last night and just called random kids out or have them raise their hand? What are you gonna do after school today? Tell me about your piano lesson yesterday. Oh, I heard you at a basketball game last night. Just asking questions to your students. They're gonna love that because you're getting to know them even on a non-music teacher level and they are gonna trust you and just have a connection with you even outside of music. I do wanna say, so it's hard transitioning from summer back to school. I know that <clears throat> summer, especially this summer, you are, um, some of you just ended school. Some of you maybe are not even done with school yet. And you're so excited to enjoy your break because I don't know about you, but I know like it just feels like we've all been kind of thrown through a blender, right? Well, I guess that's not the right wording. What what is it? Not thrown in a blender. I guess you do throw things in a blender, <laughs> but just twirl around in a blender, right? You didn't even have time to stop and think about anything. You didn't have time to stop and process what's going on and how am I feeling about this? And am I overwhelmed or not? I don't even know if I'm overwhelmed. I have no, I haven't even had time to stop. So the first thing I want you to do is enjoy your summer break. After this challenge ends, enjoy your summer. Do something for you. My family, we're going to a lake. It's 30 minutes from my house. We're going there for a week. So we're not going too far because, because of COVID. But we are taking, you know, we're going to enjoy the summer. We're going to take a break. My boys need it. I need it. We all need it. So don't feel guilty about that, about taking time for you where you're not even, maybe even your principal's like, listen, next week, I'm going to be emailing you or in a couple of weeks, I'll be emailing you about next year's schedule. And you're going to say, you know what, actually, I'm going on vacation. I'll check my email when I get back. It's okay to say that sometimes. Of course, you can't lose your job. I do realize that. But it's okay to put boundaries on your life and on yourself and of your time. It's so super important you do that. So it's hard transitioning from summer back to school because especially going into next school year, it's like fear of the unknown, not knowing what to expect, not knowing what's going to come, not knowing how your teaching situation will look like. Fear of technology, fear of are you going to do things right? What if I mess it up? I, I'm not even going to get to know my students the way I normally would because a lot of them I'm just going to be meeting through a chat box on a Zoom call. It's so 
I know it's so hard. And a lot of you, that's the main thing you're focused on right now. And I'm 100% realize that your normal um, frustrations about going back to school or fear of going back to school or worries about going back to school are magnified this year by like 10 because of what's going on with COVID, right? And so, um, so I want to say that it is just, first of all, if you wonder, am I the only one who's having a hard time transitioning from summer back to school when it's time? You're not. It's completely normal as a teacher to feel that way. You, last school year probably felt like 10 school years in one. I don't know why 10 is the magic number right now, but that's the number I keep using. So it's true though. You f- like those last few months of school, it, it was different for everyone depending on where you live. But it was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to take in, to deal with, to figure out how to do it emotions and mentally and physically. Um, I already talked about forming a relationship with your students. Stay consistent with your expectations when it comes to procedures. Okay, so let's slip, go here. Classroom management. This is where I'm at right now. Okay, so stay consistent with your expectations. Now, this is a huge one. If you've told little Johnny to stop in um, in a regular classroom setting, let's say you've told him to stop hitting his rhythm sticks together, right? Say, hey, we're not ready to play our instrument. Remember I said, if you play before I say, I'll take your instrument away. So you're going to need to leave your rhythm sticks on your lap. You turn around, he hits them again. Oh, Johnny, what did I say? Remember, what did I say? And you've given him like four or five or six or seven. He's on like chance number eight. What's little Johnny going to think? He's going to think, well, I mean, she tells me this, but nothing ever happens. And it it depends on the child, right? Every child is different. If it's a child with a a disability, maybe they're not understanding your instructions. There is a behavior plan involved. Doesn't mean let these kids get away with whatever, but there is some situation there you know about versus a child who just, he's just testing you. You know your kiddos, and that goes back to the relationship part of it, really getting to know your students. But let's say he keeps playing, and you've told him not to, and you've already told him what's going to happen if he does it again, but you don't ever take the rhythm sticks away, then you need to kind of take the instrument away. Doesn't mean he can't participate. What I usually do with kids like that, (coughs) when they have to, (laughs) excuse me, goodness, have to lose an instrument because they're playing out of turn, they can still use their hands. Body percussion is everything, especially going into next school year. That's all I started with was the kids' bodies. They sang and they did body percussion. So we're going to talk about that, like I said, when it comes to lesson planning. So know that behavior problems are going to come. Having a plan in place will help so much. It's possible to have a consistent classroom management strategy. If you're new to teaching elementary music, which a lot of you in this group are, or if you've been teaching for a long time, classroom management is something that's one of the most important things, um, in my opinion, in elementary music and teaching elementary music. Once it falls into place, like I said, when you have a procedure for everything and your kids know what to expect and it's consistent, you're going to notice your teaching falls more in place. It's going to be kind of like a pendulum shift. I almost said swift where up here is classroom management. Down here, you feel like you're teaching. It's going to eventually go like this. And then the teaching is going to go up and your classroom management will be down here. How? By staying consistent, following through with your expectations, procedures, 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 and forming relationships with your students. So um, I want to talk about. So classroom management, how do you do it online? How do you do it in virtual teaching? The same way you do it in your classroom. And you're like, yeah, right. There's no way I can do that. Well, let's talk about that. So let's talk about the different teaching situations you may find yourself in. Teaching on a cart. That's a lot of you in here I've already seen talking about. You either might be or you're already aware of the fact that you're going to be teaching on a cart. I actually saw someone in the group today also say that they taught on a cart (laughs) last school year. And moving into this school year, they will... um, they already kind of feel a little bit more confident in doing that going into this school year. So classroom management with teaching on a cart. Well, as you're more than likely, this is what's going to happen if you're teaching on a cart going into the um, the classes, the classroom teachers classes. Is that what I'm trying to say? The general general classroom teachers classrooms. That's a big sentence. You know what I'm saying? You're going to be going into the other classrooms. There we go. And while you're in there, you set up classroom management the same way you would in your class. Now, here's the deal. A lot of them, 
the teachers will already have their own classroom management systems in place. So the easiest way, in my opinion, to navigate this is to know that teacher, what classroom management systems they already have in place, and then build upon that. Now, I know that might be difficult because then you're learning what, like, I don't know, let's say you have 20 classes, you're learning, you probably have way more than that, but you're learning all these different classroom management systems. So if that's too hard to remember what teacher has what system in place, the simplest ways to do it is, let's say kiddos are not allowed to sing. Then they, um, let's say you're having to have them space out six feet apart, right? Then you're, you're going to go over that with them. Here's what I expect from you when we're doing our, uh, we're going to hit on the drum, I'm sorry, hit on our desk or the table like it's a drum because we're not allowed to use instruments. Here's my procedure for that. Just like you remember when you were in my classroom last year, or maybe you're new to Miss Peresta, what we're going to do is your hands are going to always stay on the table so I can see them, or your hands are going to stay on your lap. I would suggest on the table because if they're on your lap, you never know what they're playing within their desk, right? So your hands stay here until we're ready to play our drum. Now we're gonna play together. When I say play rhythm, when I say stop, your hands are in resting position. When I say go, we're gonna play this rhythm together. Do you see, I'm just kind of giving you ideas off the top of my head. What do you do when it's time to end an activity? Let the kiddos know, let them know how it's gonna look differently than it would in the classroom. We're not gonna be holding hands to do circle dances. We are gonna, we're gonna still do movement. We're either gonna do it at your seat or if we make a circle to do movement together, we're going to have our hands like, it's hard to show you on this, but like, <laughs> I look so awkward, like this, but you're going to, other person's hand will be like this. So they're not touching. Okay. If that makes you turn too nervous, don't even have the hands held up. Kiddos hands are always touching their laps and they're still spaced apart. Maybe you can have the classroom teacher help you out. And before music, they have something on the floor where they're spacing the kids out for um, movement time. Maybe there's a big circle that's created around the students' desks if you're doing a circle dance with sit spots. But instead of sitting, those that's where the kiddos are standing. Um, I actually had another teacher tell me an idea. And this may be impossible if you're teaching on a card. I do realize that. But um, a perfect way to space kids out six feet apart is by putting hula hoops on the ground. And then they can't, they have to stay in their hula hoop and the other kids are in their hula hoop. But try to say you have to stay in the middle of your hula hoop as it's on the ground is what I'm trying to get at. Um, I know that might be and it might be that might, uh, blah, blah. I know that might be difficult in a regular classroom. So you don't want to like completely like rearrange the classroom before you come in because it would take a long time for them to reset everything up. So you're going to have to work around what's already going on in that classroom. So yes, remember we talked about a lot of this is mindset and we're going to get into that in a little bit. So mindset, what I'm getting at is the frustration of not being able to teach music like you normally would. But in my classroom, I normally would do circle dances and the kids would or they would have a partner and they'd hold hands together and we dance around or we do a folk dance and we would move with scarves. I get that and I get it's frustrating, but I want you to keep in mind all five days this week. The main goal is for your students to learn music. That's still the main goal, even if you're still being told to send home paper packets next year. As long as you're creating ways for your students to learn music, that's the main goal. And you have to take your feelings out of it, unfortunately. But I know that's so hard. And I'm not saying that to sound cruel at all. But I mean, if you stay stuck in the, I wish it was like this still. I wish I didn't have to do it this way. I wish I didn't have to. That's going to keep you stuck. So instead of, that's how I felt. I walked into my classroom and said, this is not fair. I just saw that music classroom over there that had 20 drums and xylophones and I have nothing. I have no teaching resources. I, have, I don't even have a teacher to follow in their footsteps to use any resources that they left behind for me. I, and, but instead of standing there going, I can't do this. This is too hard. I said, how am I going to do this? How can I move forward? What can I do each month? What can I do moving into next school year and the following school year? And, the, and then it got me excited to think, I can do this. It looks totally different than I ever expected it would, but I can do this. And the same is for you guys. You can do this. So while you're in those classrooms, um, I would suggest find out if your students are allowed to sing or not sing. That's a huge part of it. If they cannot sing, you might be wearing a mask. You sing a song, have them listen, pat the steady beat, snap their fingers, um, do the rhythm, depending on what the grade level is. You know, with older kids, you can do more. And then um, say, now, here's what I want you to do. This song you just learned, you're each going to get a piece of paper. And I want you to take this home and practice singing it on your own at home. 
Okay. Then when you come in next time, we're going to build upon this song and we're going to do other things. There's so much, and I could be here all day talking about this, but I mean, I just know because of experience, there's so much you can do with music without anything at your disposal. So much as I had to do it. So body percussion, huge, 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 huge body percussion. They're only touching their own body. They're not touching their neighbor. They're not spreading germs. They're just clapping, snapping, stomping, patting, tapping their head, their shoulders, their stomach. There's all kinds of things you can do with body percussion. Movement. You can still do um, group movement activities, but have the kids stay in their own space or their own bubble, as I like to call it. This is your bubble. Don't move outside your bubble. Pretend a bubble is around your body and you can't move out of it. So you can turn in your bubble. You can walk in place in your bubble. You can jog in your bubble. You can go side to side in your bubble, but you can't leave your bubble. The kids will love that. You could become like um, every time you go to their classroom, you're just doing movement in their bubbles. Be creative with that. If they can sing, like I said, a good idea is to have the kiddos. This is, I mean, I know right now the singing thing is it's dependent on each state. I get that. So if they are allowed to sing, there's still going to probably be precautions put in place by the CDC guidelines. So find out from your administrator, first of all, what am I allowed to do? What am I allowed to do? Because I don't want to do anything I'm not allowed to do. Then when you find that out, go from there, okay? So with singing, if they're allowed to, then um, have the kids face away from each other and maybe walk to a wall. If they are allowed to sing, have them walk to a wall, face the wall, which is so awkward, isn't it? Because you're always saying, eyes on me. Everybody pay attention. I'm up here, eyes on me. But it's going to be a little different. There's still a way, though, you can informally assess them. Have them face the walls while they sing. And then you're, and we're going to talk. I'm getting in a whole lot I wasn't even going to talk about today. So you're getting a preview because we are going to talk about this on day three and four. I'm just too excited. So while they're, wa while you're walking around listening to them sing, then, you know, you're kind of still trying to keep your distance too, but you're listening. You're still listening the way you would walk between the rows in your classroom or walk in a circle in your classroom to listen. The same way you're doing that in your classroom, you would do in this uh, this teacher's classroom and you're walking around listening while they're like spaced apart, facing outwards. When it comes to instruments with classroom management, um, it depends also, like I said, on the guidelines. I've seen people saying they're doing recorders and some people saying they're not. Uh, I would say if students are using their own recorder, they're not sharing it, they are cleaning it. I, For me, that would make me nervous, but it's totally up to you. They're cleaning the recorder. They have their own place. They put it. No one else is touching it. That's totally fine. With instruments as well, um, if you're using instruments, if you're on a cart, you need to bring ones on a cart that are easily, you know, easy to tote. If you are wanting to use like rhythm sticks and are, you know, um, or smaller like glockenspiels or things like that, if, or like the small rhythm instruments, you know what I'm getting at. If you're wanting to use bigger instruments, but you can't tote them back and forth, maybe you could keep, uh, like a drum and larger, a larger xylophone in one of the upper, depending on the way your school's laid out. So let's say it's upper elementary, lower elementary. And I know that's not probably the case for you, but designate a certain classroom to keep a larger, a couple larger instruments in down each hallway. So when it's time to go down that hallway for a certain class, you just got to walk by, pull it out, bring it. Okay. I'm just kind of giving ideas off the top of my head. I hope this is helpful. So let's back, get back to classroom management because we're going to talk all about that later on in the challenge. So with classroom management, if you're on a cart, just still set up your procedures. Everything you would set a procedure for in your regular classroom, in your music classroom, set a procedure for in the teacher's classroom. What do you expect them to do? When you come in, where are their voices? Where are their hands? How do you want their area to look around them? Where should their eyes be? What are you going to be doing? How do you want them tr to transition between activities? If they are moving around, where do you expect them to go, right? <clears throat> These are all things to consider. When it comes to classroom management while you're virtually teaching, right now, like you guys are in the comments and you're commenting. The same way with kiddos. And now you're probably not going to be doing Facebook Live. I realize that most schools do not want you doing that. So let's say you're either, and this is what, everything is different. Every school is different is what I meant. So I'm not going to get into all the different technology today. But yes, there's Google Classroom. There's Zoom. There's Seesaw. There's 900 other things out there that you guys have already seen. So there, whatever you're using, let's just use Google Classroom as an example. If your kiddos are on there, and you're doing something like this where you're showing your face and they're in the comments, have a procedure for that. If you see kiddos over there just like commenting and laughing or they've even said it where they're privately having a conversation, but you can read kids' faces. 
you're, you're very good at that, aren't you? Okay. You as a teacher, you, you see these kids that are kind of just like seeing each other in the square giggling back and forth. Same way you would have classroom management in your classroom, have classroom management. Um, whoever's over in the chat box and is commenting right now, instead of paying attention, you need to get back on track. And you can see the eyes like, oh, she saw that, right? Um, so procedures for that. What are your procedures for the chat box? A big problem, as you've already seen, if this is the way you taught at the last end of last school year, going into this school year, is um, the talking at the everybody talking at the same time. If that was a struggle for you, let's say you're even entering one of the classroom, like a second grade call, they already have set up and they invited you to come in and join them. And you're sitting there like, everybody's talking at once. This is insane. I cannot say a word. Have a procedure for that. Okay. Have a procedure for that. Remember, you're still the teacher. Hey, everybody, I want you to find your mute button and I want everybody to be quiet. And just like you would at school, when Miss Presta says, does anybody have a question? Then you can either raise your hand with the raise the hand icon, type me in the comment box, or if it's a little, a little kiddo, just type any letter in the comment box or raise your hand and I'll see you and I'll unmute you when it's time for me to answer questions. Okay. And you're going to, just like I said earlier, you're going to have to go over procedures over and over and over the same with virtual teaching. You'll need to remind the kids what to do. Okay. Um, what are some other situations? Those are the main ones I could think of is any type of virtual teaching. It's going to look different, whether you're live simulcasting from your classroom, um, teaching virtually, and then also teaching on a car and teaching in person. Yes, there's a lot of other situations, but those are the main, main ones I wanted to cover. So a big part of classroom management is to set up your classroom for success if you're back in a school setting, but we're going to talk about ways to make your virtual classroom look like you're setting it up for success. Okay. I want you to think back to last school year and how you had your classroom set up. I actually today was talking with a teacher who um, you may have actually seen her post in the Facebook group. She is in my Harmony membership too. And so I've gotten to know her story. We've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one calls and she was telling me her classroom setup is just awkward. You have to go down a big staircase. It's very narrow. The kids have to go across the field. What am I trying to say? The outside part. So a lot of times they come in with muddy shoes in the winter with coats. There's not a lot of room in there to put their stuff. And there's not even a lot of space in there to do movement. Can any of you relate to that with your classrooms? So I realize when I give suggestions about what to do in your classroom, it depends on your classroom. Some of you have classrooms the size of closets. Some of you have large classrooms. Some of you have no classrooms. Some of you have classrooms you maybe share with another teacher. It just depends on your situation. And so I know when I'm giving suggestions with any suggestion I give ever, ever about anything, you take it and make it your own. I'm so big on that. I wish someone had told me that when I was starting out. In fact, I'm in the middle of writing a book about that right now. So that's that stay tuned for that. It's coming soon. But anyways, something I, I, there's so much that I did not learn in college. There's so much. No one told me when I became a music teacher that I would need to know little things like you might have a classroom you can do things in, or you might learn things to do in a classroom and you were not going to have any space to do it. No, or you're going to walk into a classroom and have nothing <laughs> like things. No one tells you right to prepare yourself. Okay. So with, um, setting up your classroom. So how you set up your classroom is unique to who you are. You're going to hear me say this a lot, but you are a unique person. I do not think it's a coincidence. You are in the exact school with the exact students that, that you're in, that you're teaching because you, the reason I'm so big on not doing things like everyone else does it and not just using a cookie cook, cookie cutter approach because imposter syndrome sets in, um, it's probably not even a word, but it's a word I use called comparisonitis, because you're unique. You are an individual. You're allowed to do things your way. You're allowed to be you in your classroom. You also bring in a musicianship that another teacher may not have. What That makes you unique. Share those experiences with your students. So the same way with that is when you're setting up your classroom, I want you to make it unique to you as well. If you, you know, a, a teacher came in and they had all the instruments on one wall, the other wall was filled with chairs, the other wall had books, it just looked like a symmetrical whatever, and you don't want to do it that way, that's totally fine. It's totally fine. I get questions all the time like, should I have risers in my room or chairs or a carpet or sit spots? My answer is yes. 
But yeah, I say I say it like that because what do you want to do? Right? What do you want to do? If if the teacher, you know, like maybe you're following in their footsteps, or maybe even you yourself have used chairs for years and years and years, and you're like, you know what? I want to just keep a few chairs in my room if I'm in my classroom again. Um to um like some for just the drums or just for centers or just enough chairs for you know ac different activities I want to do but not for the entire class change it up it's okay to change things up if you've set your classroom up a certain way and you're not really liking the way you have it set up anymore there's nothing saying you can't change it up that's okay to do so um I want you to remember that as you're planning to set up your classroom, make it unique to you. Um, when it comes to setting up your classroom, my, what I started, I started with desks, not by choice. That's what they gave me. Who has desks in an elementary music classroom? And if you do, I'm not judging you. I just, I remember going, what? And they were the kind where I couldn't even just keep chairs in there. It was the attached chair attached to the desk kind. So I was like, well, this just kind of takes up my whole room. You know, I didn't have the, you know, largest music classroom in the world either. So I said, um, is there any way like I could not have these in here next year? <laughs> so then they gave me a full class set of chairs, which was so sweet. And I remember I still thought this is taking up my entire classroom. Then I took ORF level one and I realized I kind of want some space for my kids to move. And I wanted a more open space. Everyone's different. If you don't want that, that's okay. But I decided for me what worked was keeping my larger instruments against a wall, only pulling them out when I planned my lesson plans and I knew I'd be needing larger instruments. I'd pull them out, have the chairs where the kids would need to sit on to play the large drums and the large xylophones. Sometimes kids would even just sit on their knees. It depended on the activity. Um, and then I decided I wanted them to just sit on the floor. I had no budget, remember? So it was either Lowe's or Home Depot. I ended up hating these carpets, but it's all I could, that's all I had right away. I had, to, I had to kind of think quick. Gave me those sample carpets that you see in the stores that they would just throw it to the trash. I remember driving up one day and saying, "I do you have a class set of just these sample carpets I could take back to my classroom? Sure. They gave me like 25 of them. And the reason I said I ended up not liking them, they worked great. The kids come in, get a carpet, sit on it, but they would just fray and found the carpet fuzz everywhere. But then eventually I ended up to like a floor carpet and now sit spots are all the rage. And um, I at one point had risers in my room. I didn't like it because I kept having to totem back and forth between my music classroom and then the gym where the programs were and back and forth and back. And then they ended up breaking. So I ended up the way it finally ended up was a few chairs where they stayed by the instruments in the back of my room, pull them out when I needed. I had shelves with bins for the um, smaller instruments that I kind of categorized by what was in them. Then under that was books that I would read to my students. Um, all my books, like teaching resources, was by my desk, which was in the back on the other side of my classroom. Sh should have drawn a diagram. If I thought a quick ahead of time, I would have done that. But um, and then motivational posters on my um, in the back of my room by some you know different artists and composers, or just motivational posters in general, which I would change up. I had a bulletin board for. Um, we did a culture of the month every month, different composer of the month every month, depending on the composer's birthday. Missing something. But that would change. I kept a map up all year and I would just kind of put a pin in where the composer or culture of the month was that we were talking about with different pictures of the um, uh, that culture, representing that culture and the different songs that we did. And I would put them on that bulletin board. Um, I also had... Um, some student dinosaur computers. That's all they had for me at the time. And I had a little table set up for that. And then I had some, like a word wall where different musical terms the kids would need to know. And then as they left my classroom, I had a wall over here that was those cabinets I told you about. I used that whole cabinet space, the outs, the like the cabinet doors for students to write note cards about what did they learn about? Um, here's like, okay, like let's say this is steady beat. What did you learn about study B as we were lining up? Sometimes I would um, have like a pencils and note cards and like some tape and they could tape up what they learn and hang it by study B. So eventually then we'd put a different word up there and do that. And it became, and these are just ideas I'm sharing with you. You do not have to do it this way. But what I'm saying is it took me a while to get to that point where I realized, what do I want to have in here? How do I want to make this work? What do I want it to look like? How much floor space do I want to have? Where do I want to set up my things? And then I did that. 
So that's what I suggest for you to do is to think about your students, your school, how much space you have, what's your teaching style, and then create a classroom setup um, ideas based on that, okay? Now, I said there's a way to still make your classroom look like a classroom even if you're teaching virtually. If you're teaching virtually, behind me, you see this white wall? I could have some words, the word wall I just talked about, I could have that set up behind me. Hey guys, today we're gonna be talking, if you're teaching live, okay? Or if you're even recording a video that you're sharing a YouTube link out with your class on Google. It, it, it just depends on what you're doing. Hey, this is Steady B, okay? And what, remember we talked about this in our classroom? Here's all the things involved with that. Or, hey guys, um, this is a poster. I really wanna talk to you about this quote right here. Let's talk about what that means. Or, here's my story I'm reading you today, and then you share your screen on about the story you're reading, maybe you it's a ebook that you're sharing with your students. There's so many different ways to make it look, you know, like user friendly, make it look colorful behind you or just put some color, put a colorful backdrop behind you, even if you don't want to decorate it with different word walls. You can still make it look like your classroom, even if you're not in a classroom. If you're teaching on a cart, decorate that cart, make it look fun. Maybe hang some words from the cart or maybe make it like just have your name hanging down or have some kind of decoration on it that makes it look musical with some musical notes hanging down or something like that. Um, I don't know. Just think of different ways. Think outside of the box to still make your classroom your classroom, even if you're not technically in your classroom. Maybe even if you're entering a classroom teacher's room. Bring up something, bring some things with you on your cart that you can set up real quick in like a music corner. Something that'll be so simple to just put up, take down. Um, each time you go to your, to the different classroom teachers' rooms, you can um, set up a little corner and like have something hung up real quick. Maybe it's just super quick where it's like some, they're already on clothespins and you have like something where you can just clothespin up some three different words. Today we're gonna be learning about, or the song we're doing, we're gonna talk about tempo, the beat and the dynamics and hang it up right there, bam, bam, bam. I don't know, just something you bring with you to make like a little music wall so it still feels like you're setting up a bulletin board. Even if you, let's say your school tells you you're starting out the school year, teaching on a cart, teaching virtually, or still just sending on paper packets. But they say, but the second half of the school year, we might start our normal routine again. You might have your regular schedule again where the kiddos are coming to you again. That's why it's so important right now to think about setting up your classroom or to think about classroom management, even if right away you're not in your classroom. Because once you are, as you're already thinking through this stuff, it's already going to be thought through. So when you see your students, then if you are able to get them back in your classroom at all this year, then you're already good to go. OK. OK, so right along with planning the way your classroom will look, I want you to think about how you'll set up your music cart, this, the way students will interact with each other if social distancing is still in place and unique ways you can still bring music experiences to your students, even if it's not the way you would normally do things. Remember your why. This is huge. I want to talk about this. So what do I mean by remember your why? We talked about this already where it's so easy to get bogged down with I'm frustrated because or I wish things were this way or this isn't fair or I didn't become a music teacher to teach this way or I just want to see my students or this isn't the way to create music. I agree with all of that. One thousand percent. It is hard. It's frustrating, it's overwhelming, it's not fair, but it's also your students are dealing with so much frustrations. There's so much going on in their little lives, no matter what type of school you teach at. There are so many of them who miss you just as much as you miss them. So remembering why did you become a music teacher in the first place? I love asking music teachers this question because a lot of times you kind of just forget. I know I have before. What was my why? Well, my why was I started as a piano performance major and I thought I'm going to, you know, travel around and play piano and play for various choirs and da, 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 da. And I did those things, but I started volunteering in my community. I lived in Tulsa at the time and I really enjoyed and I did private lessons. I really enjoyed teaching music to kids. And I went, what am I doing? Why am I not? wanting to teach music. I have a passion for kids. I have a passion for music. I feel like they need to kind of collide. So I 
switched my um, degree plan in the middle of my sophomore year. Apparently I'm good at doing things in the middle of a year, like starting my teaching career. And I switched to music education. And I'm telling you, I was so passionate to get that degree and get in there and teach kiddos. It was such a passion of mine to share my love of music, but also not just my love of music. I kind of, without getting into it too deep, came from a family that experienced trauma. I grew up in a childhood with a lot of turmoil and trauma. So I really wanted to just help kids in general and to just be there for them and have a relationship and be a role model and to just be someone they could have conversations with, but also teach music because a lot of these kids have never experienced a music class. A lot of your students have never experienced a music class. And because of you, even virtually, even on a cart, even in your classroom, even on a paper packet where you're suggesting ideas for them to learn music at home with their families, because of you, they're able to learn music. And I think that's incredible. You're bringing a gift to these kids without even realizing it that they maybe would not have ever been able to receive before. But because you're bringing it to them, it's so special, so important that they are able to learn music. So remember your why. If you get stuck on, I'm so frustrated, I'm overwhelmed, when is this ever going to end? I just want to have my normal routine back. That's normal to feel that way. I said at the very beginning of this video to have feelings, process through your emotions, let yourself feel feelings. But then remember why you became a music teacher and it will help keep you going on those frustrating days, the frustrating weeks where you don't know what's going on and nobody's communicating at your school is it, frustrating. You've maybe seen two kids out of a whole class of 25. But I also want to remind you to keep showing up for one kid the same way you would for 25 because that child is there to learn music from you. Thank you so much for listening in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, I would love for you to review the show and leave a rating on iTunes. To find out more about how I can help you gain momentum in your elementary music teaching career, head to thedomesticmusician.com where you'll find free downloads, courses, the blog, and so much more. Continue teaching music and never doubt the impact you're making each and every day in the lives of your students.